In the first part of this lecture series, I advise the students to memorize the line items in the income statement, statement of changes in equity, and statement of financial position, as well as certain notes such as the computation of the net sales and this cost of sales. Memorizing something like this, however, is not easy unless one understands well what he is attempting to memorize. So let's make some sense out of this cost of sales computation. Let's say you bought 50 bars of a certain chocolate from a grocery store intended for your personal consumption. But after eating 10 bars, you thought of making business out of chocolates. So you invested the remaining 40 bars at the beginning of this month in your small business. Those 40 chocolate bars comprise your store's merchandise inventory at the beginning of this month in terms of bars or pieces. After a few days, you purchased online 100 bars in behalf of your business. Those 100 bars are your store's purchases. Again, in terms of number of bars. Upon closer inspection, however, you notice that two of those chocolate bars are of a different kind. So you return the two bars to the seller. Those two bars are your store's purchase returns, which decreased the 100 bars you had purchased to 98 bars. The 98 bars are considered as net purchases. When you add the 98 bars to the 40 bars at the beginning of the period, what do you have? Of course, your store at that point has 138 bars. But how would you describe those 138 bars? The number of chocolate bars which your store can sell or the number of goods available for sale. Let's assume further that at the end of the month, you counted the remaining chocolate bars in your store, which as per your counting, totaled 65. What is the 65? The remaining chocolate bars at the end of the month or the merchandise inventory end of your store in terms of number of bars. Your store had 138 bars available for sale, but by the end of the month, only 65 remained. What happened to the difference? Hopefully, you did not eat them. What happened to the difference of 73? You sold them. Therefore, the 73 can be described as goods sold or number of goods sold. But as you already know by now, just based on the definitions of accounting, information must be expressed in financial terms, in terms of money, not just number of chocolate bars. So let's assume you purchase the chocolates at 150 pesos each. This merchandise inventory beginning must be 6,000 pesos. That is 40 chocolate bars multiplied by 150. These purchases must be 15,000 pesos. That is 100 multiplied by 150. These purchase returns must be 2 bars multiplied by 150 equals 300 making net purchases equal to 14,700 pesos that is purchases of 15,000 less purchase returns of 300 net purchases of 14,700 add to the merchandise inventory beginning of 6,000 equals 20,700. Since this 20,700 is already in terms of money, better describe it now as not just goods available for sale, but as cost of goods available for sale. Merchandise inventory end, 
must be 65 bars multiplied by 150 pesos equals 9,750. Deduct merchandise inventory end of 9,750 from the cost of goods available for sale of 20,700 and we get 10,950 worth of goods sold. Because this 10,950 is in terms of money, we can describe it as not just goods sold, but as cost of goods sold or cost of sales. As additional information, let's assume that when you purchase the 100 chocolate bars online, your store shouldered the transportation or delivery cost from the seller to your store which amounted to 400 pesos. That 400 pesos is known as freight in from your store's viewpoint, being the buyer or purchaser. Obviously, the 400 pesos freight in is an additional cost to your store's purchases. That is the reason why freight in is added to purchases. When freight in is added to the purchases account, the resulting amount is what we may call as cost of goods delivered. Let's assume further that your store purchased the chocolate bars on account, which was subsequently paid within the discount period. And therefore, your business was able to avail of the cash discount of 1% which is equivalent to 147 pesos computed by multiplying 1% or 0.01 by 150 pesos and then multiplying the product again by 98 bars, not 100 bars because two bars were returned, remember? That 147 pesos from your store's perspective is known as purchase discount which obviously again, like purchase returns, decreased what your store needed to pay for the purchase of the chocolate bars. It decreased the cost of goods delivered. That's why it is shown here as a deduction from the cost of goods delivered. And because there are two items now which decreased the cost of goods delivered, the amount of each of these two items, purchase returns and purchase discounts, must be written not under this cost of goods delivered on the second money column, but on the first money column. Only the sum of these two items is extended to the second money column. This amount now minus the cost of goods delivered of 15,400 would give us net purchases of 14,953. Add this amount of net purchases to this merchandise inventory at the beginning equals cost of goods available for sale amounting to 20,953. Then, less merchandise inventory at the end of 9,750 equals 11,203 pesos cost of goods sold or cost of sales. Since purchase allowances are normally included with purchase returns in one account name, let's add end allowances here. Let's recap how we arrived at this amount of net purchases. Purchases of 15,000 pesos add freight in of 400 pesos equals cost of goods delivered amounting to 15,400. Less purchase returns and allowances and purchase discounts of 447 equals 14,953 net purchases. That is the reason why, as you can see here, these items from purchases up to purchase discounts are all 
indented and not aligned with these ad net purchases. Each of these items is part of the computation of net purchases and hence all of them are indented under this ad net purchases. Now that you have proper understanding of each of these terms in note 2, as well as why we add an item to or deduct it from another, knowing by heart the computation of this cost of goods sold or cost of sales will be a lot easier. When you prepare the income statement of your store, this cost of sales will be deducted from the net sales to arrive at the gross profit. In case there is other income, it would be added to the gross profit to get the total income. Expenses composed of administrative expenses, distribution cost, finance cost, and other expenses, if any, would then be deducted from the total income in order to arrive at your store's net income or net loss. Not that difficult, right? Now, let's continue with the other notes of sample merchandising. This is note 3, showing the computation of other income. Note 4 is for the administrative expenses, sometimes called general and administrative expenses. While note 5 is for the distribution cost. Note 6 is for finance cost, which is the interest and other charges incurred in connection with borrowing funds. Distribution costs are those expenses which are directly related to the sale or to the selling of goods. Hence, it is also known as selling expenses. So the store space rental is one of the distribution costs because a store is the place where entities sell their goods or merchandise. Of course, the rental of office space is not a distribution cost, but part of administrative expenses in note number 4. The salaries and wages of office or administrative employees are considered administrative expenses but the salaries and wages of store employees are distribution cost similarly all other expenses of and in the store like utilities telephone supplies depreciation and even insurance should be presented as distribution cost while those expenses incurred in the office or for the purpose of administering or managing should be part of administrative expenses. All operating expenses not related to the selling function of the business and to cost of goods sold are normally included in administrative expenses. As for the bad debts or doubtful accounts, or uncollectible accounts expense, the classification depends on who is in charge of granting credit to customers or of accounts receivable collection. If the sales manager is, then doubtful accounts should be part of distribution cost. But if the mentioned responsibilities are performed by another officer other than the sales manager, then it should be considered as an administrative expense. If the problem is silent, doubtful accounts should be classified as an administrative expense. Advertising expenses are incurred for the purpose of increasing sales and so should be part of distribution cost. Same thing with sales commissions. Freight out, unlike freight in, should not be part of the computation of cost of goods sold or cost of sales, but as distribution costs. 
By the way, although not really a requirement, notice how I prefer to arrange the expenses. From highest down to the lowest. Except if there are miscellaneous or other administrative expenses or other distribution costs, which must be the last regardless of amount. The idea is so that, especially in the real business world, one would be able to immediately notice the major expenses or those expenses for which the entity spends large sums of money. And before I forget, a very important thing. Please keep in mind that the accounts and account classifications in these sample financial statements are not exhaustive or fully comprehensive, meaning they do not include all possible account titles or classifications. These sample financial statements are only intended to guide students in financial statement presentation. In other words, there could be other distribution costs aside from those you can see here. Same with administrative expenses and other notes. In the income statement, if there are other expenses which cannot be classified as distribution cost, administrative expenses, finance cost, or as part of cost of sales, such as loss on sale of an equipment or loss on sale of trading securities, a separate expense classification called other expenses should be made here under these expenses. And speaking of trading securities, that is another current asset classification which may be included here in the statement of financial position. In addition, a supporting note may not be required if there is only one account name in that classification or category. For example, there is only one prepaid expense account, let's say office supplies only. The notes to financial statements may not necessarily include a separate note for prepaid expenses. Accountants have the choice to just forward immediately the account name office supplies with its corresponding amount to the statement of financial position without creating a supporting note in the notes to financial statements because there is only one prepaid expense anyway. Lastly, be reminded that you do not have to use the exact account titles in these sample financial statements. Rather, when you are asked to prepare financial statements, you need to use the account names provided in the problems chart of accounts, meaning those account titles used in recording the transactions and consequently appearing in the worksheet and the trial balance. In the next episode of this video series, I will be illustrating step by step the preparation of a functional form income statement a statement of changes in equity, a report form statement of financial position, and notes to financial statements using information from a worksheet. Until then, thank you for watching.